much has changed over the last few years with what we're doing with this disease. These are my disclosures. They haven't changed since yesterday. So I'll talk a little bit about a brief overview of endometrial cancer. I know that you got just a, a great talk just now about upfront treatment, um, as well as traditional chemotherapy for advanced and recurrent disease, and then get into what we're doing with targeted therapy now. <clears throat> These are the incidence rates. You can see that um, endometrial cancer is found quite a bit in uh, North America, as, as well as Asia. Um, but importantly, it really is increasing. It's the 15th most common cancer worldwide, with a worldwide incidence of about 380,000 in 2018, and a tenfold increase in incidence over the last few years. We're seeing something very similar in the United States, and it really is related to the epidemic of obesity. Um, this is just the stage-specific survival, and it just informs our talk today, because what we see is, as, as we get a higher stage, regional spread, and then stage four, um, the, the survival does go down, and that's where we have the greatest unmet need. So let's talk a little bit about standard of care for advanced and recurrent disease. Um, you can see this is the, the United States National Comprehensive uh, Cancer Network recommendations. That the major question is, is have they had radiation before? And so if you have a local regional recurrence <clears throat> without any evidence of distal metastasis, you do have an opportunity to potentially utilize radiotherapy if you haven't previously, especially if the disease is confined to the vagina. However, if the disease is out of the uh, pelvis and into the upper abdomen, you really are looking at primarily chemotherapy and now targeted therapies um, are options as well. This is the, the guideline for the systemic therapy for recurrent or metastatic disease. You can see they strongly encourage participation in clinical trials, but this is changing as we get more and more um, drugs that are eligible uh, uh, for our patients. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the different types of drugs that have been utilized in um, advanced and recurrent endometrial cancer. Hormones are definitely an option, and it really is about figuring out when in the disease status that the patient should be utilized or should uh, be offered hormones, as well as potentially combinations that we're going to talk about that take. Um, molecular uh, treatments and and um, combine them with hormonal therapy. Chemotherapy, this is a chemosensitive disease. Unfortunately, the duration of response to chemotherapy is limited, and so you can get a response for some period of time, but then the cancer is going to return. And then there's a, a lot of interest in so-called biologics that are, are acting on known aberrations and signaling pathways. So it does you know, histology does matter. If you look at, this, these are data from um, the several gynecologic oncology group trials, they're looking at what the histology is in primary disease. You can see it's predominantly grade one to two endometrioid, which I think those of you that are practitioners will know that. That's what you see, that's your bread and butter with um, uterine cancer. However, when the patients recur, it's predominantly going to be grade three, high grade, and non-endometrioid types like serous. And, and that's why we see such bad outcomes in those patients that recur. This just shows in a survival, you know, does it matter when we see higher levels of clear cell, higher levels of serous? And the answer is yes. When you look at this, these curves, the worst two lines are the clear cell and the serous. In general, the mixed and the endometrioid patients do well. And again, this is combined data from the gynecological oncology group trials just showing you that no matter what the treatment is, they do better if they have endometrioid type disease. So first talking about hormonal therapy, arguably the first targeted therapy. The, um, when we see progesterone receptor expression, it does make us think that potentially the use of anti-hormones makes sense. The highest proportion of um, expression is found in grade one, and then we see uh, reducing expression of the progesterone receptor as the grade increases. And in general, response to different progesterone agents does correlate to the um, presence of positive progesterone receptor. This is a number of hormonal therapies that have been looked at. Um, we in the United States use um, uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate alternating with tamoxifen. Um, that 
That's where we get our highest response rates. And, and for patients that it does work, it can be a durable response where they're on for more than a year and they tolerate it so well. So it is a very reasonable option. The single agents are also interesting, but I'm gonna show you some combination data outside of only hormones that I think is pretty compelling and is what we tend to, to utilize now in lieu of you know single agent, let's say, nastrozole or letrozole. When we talk about chemotherapy in general, if it's the first time a patient has ever been treated with chemotherapy, we see response rates of around 50% and progression-free survival on average of about a year, overall survival of about three years. Once we get into second line, that reduces to about a 15% response rate. And in third and fourth line, we're looking at about a 5% response rate, if that. This is just a schematic of the way that we've progressed through different chemotherapies, initially starting with single agent doxorubicin or adromycin, um, moving on to combinations with adromycin cytoxin, adromycin cisplatin, adromycin ta uh, paclitaxel, and then ultimately um, paclitaxel and carboplatin. And that's based on the GOG 209. This study was presented in 2012. We're still eagerly anticipating the publication, um, but enrolled patients with stage three or four or recurrent endometrial cancer, they had to have an adenocarcinoma, no prior chemotherapy and measurable disease. They were random to doxorubicin, cisplatin, and paclitaxel versus carboplatin and paclitaxel. And what they it, it found was equivalent, this was a non-inferior trial, they found it equal of a vital. Then, based on, on the lower levels of um, adverse events that were seen with paclitaxel and carboplatin, um, that this was the new backbone of these novel therapies have been added as we move forward. So, and really moving away from these chemotherapies in, and tr treating this tumor uh, based on its molecular um, aberration, um, this is a classic slide from him and a hand that look at all of the different um, in cancer that help grow an aberration. You will believe the most, in fact, it's that it is not to molecular aberration. And so we see in KRAS, in HER2, in beta catenin. And as we've grown um, in drug development, and as we've learned about these molecular abnormalities, we have more and more drugs in which we can utilize to target these, this cancer. So first, let's start with the pediatric kinase AKT pathway. As I mentioned, about 80% of endometrial type tumors have some kind of abnormality in um, in this uh, in this pathway. And then we also do see KRAS mutations. We've had a number of different trials looking at single agents was because obviously when we first started utilizing targeted therapy, we're going to start with single agent. But overall, this this slide is filled with data, but it really is this bottom line pretty disappointing. The, the single agent data are pretty modest. We're not seeing a lot of benefit when we target the um, pediatric kinase AKT pathway. You can see here, temsirolimus, ridiforolimus, everolimus, all mTOR inhibitors, very limited activity. Only temsirolimus has had some activity in the app when the patient hasn't had chemotherapy. You can see response rates up to about 24%. The number of single agent pediatric kinase inhibitors, all with you know, fair um, uh, response rates. And then cellumetinib, which is a neck inhibitor, with only a 6% response rate. Although, importantly, that trial was not selected by RAS mutation. So we thought, well, if if the, the single agents aren't good, we had some preclinical data that indicated that we could potentially 
combine agents that targeted PI3 kinase with agents that targeted MAC. And so we did this trial, which was meant to be a randomized trial between MAC inhibitor trametinib or trametinib plus GSK2141795, which is an AKT inhibitor. You can tell this drug didn't do well. It never got a name. And that's because it was just really toxic. As we were moving through the safety lead-in to make sure that the drugs could be combined, there was there was so much toxicity that we really had no opportunity to see response. And so this the combination of the, the RAS, RAP, and PF3 kinase pathway has not really been further explored. So what are the other options? We, we have combined the mTOR inhibitor Everlimus with a letrozole, which is an anti-hormone. Um, and this is something now that is compendium listed in the United States. So we are able to prescribe this for our patients. And it's based on these data, which you can see that the Everlimus alone, again, not many objective responses, 0% objective responses, but when we add letrozole, um, we see response rates that approach 30%, including multiple patients with complete responses, which obviously is very unusual in a recurrent and mitral setting. And interestingly, we looked uh, further at adding metformin to this, um, this combination and saw equivalent of responses, but improvement in the number of patients that had stable disease, which is a, uh, an obviously a win. If we can have patients that are on for a longer period of time, um, that, that is a, a success for these patients. So that led to GOG3007, which is a randomized trial that combined the combination of Everlimus and Letrozole with the alternating uh, tamoxifen and hydroxyprogesterone acetate that I discussed previously, and this was in all advanced or recurrent endometrial cancer that had um, they could have prior chemotherapy, they didn't exclude that. And they saw um, slightly better uh, objective response, especially in those patients that did not, did not have prior chemotherapy. Um, but importantly, the progression-free survival was doubled and the overall survival has not yet been reached in the Everlimus and Letrozole arm. And these are just the curves that reflect those numbers. You can see improved progression-free and overall survival in the group that got Everlimus and Letrozole. And this study is now being, the combination is now being explored compared to chemotherapy. So there's a randomized trial that will that will pit Everlimus and Letrozole to paclitaxel and carboplatin. And again, if we can avoid chemotherapy, at least you know, push it down the road a little bit, that's it's a real benefit for our patients because generally they tolerate this regimen quite well. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the anti-angiogenic agents. This is a schematic of a number of different agents that have been looked at. Of course, many of us are most familiar with bevacizumab, but there's a number of other drugs such as brevinib and sidarinib that have shown real activity um, in endometrial cancer. Importantly, not only yielding objective responses, but also prolonged stable disease. And I think, you know, in the United States, the single agent bevacizumab is considered an option um, and a possibility for, for patients with this disease. So these are the data around bevacizumab. This patient population generally had one prior therapy. There was 30% with serous um, and response rates right were around 13%. But again, as I mentioned, that progression-free survival more than six months was 40%, which is important because generally in second line and beyond, progression-free survival is only about two to three months. It's basically, once you look with imaging, you're gonna see progression. And so we saw a number of patients, 40% or more, having greater than eight cycles. And so showing that you're getting durable response to therapy, which is, and, and, and in a very tolerable agent, that's very ideal. Sidarinib, another drug which has been um, quite successful, although not something we use in standard of care, um, I think just because of availability, but this trial is very similar to the last trial, which is about 70% uh, of patients had one prior therapy, about 25% of patients were serious, and they had about a 12% response rate, and about 30% were progression-free at six months. And this shows proof of principle. Anti-angiogenics work, work in endometrial cancer. So if it works, then let's try to see if we can add it to chemotherapy. This was GUG86P. Again, no prior chemotherapy, stage three or four disease, randomized to three different arms, paclitaxel, carboplatin, and bevacizumab, followed by bevacizumab maintenance, paclitaxel, carboplatin, uh, temsterolimus, which is the PI3, or the mTOR inhibitor we discussed, followed by temsterolimus, 
maintenance, and then a combination that included ixibepilone, which is a chemotherapy that was of interest at that time, and again, combined it with bevacizumab followed by bevacizumab maintenance. What they found was the progression-free survival in the three arms really compared back to a reference arm of paclitaxel and carboplatin was no different, so did not indicate any benefit of the addition of these drugs to chemotherapy. Hard to know what this means, but there was a potential improvement in overall survival compared to control um, in the group that got paclitaxel, carboplatin, and bevacizumab. So this wasn't the goal of the study. It wasn't a primary endpoint, so we don't know if it's it's um, an outlier, but it is something that is you know somewhat interesting to see this effect in it with bevacizumab on overall survival rather than on response or progression-free survival. Now the MITO group, um, looked at, uh, it was a randomized phase three trial, very similar to what we just talked about, looking at um, paclitaxel carboplatin with or without bevacizumab, and they found similar um, results. Improved objective response, but really no improvement in um, progression-free or um, overall survival. And so this has not been explored further. Now, um, PER2 amplification has gotten a lot of excitement over the last few years. This is obviously something that's not very common in endometrial type tumors, but it's very common in the non endometrial type tumors. We see um, her uh, overexpression upwards of you know, 50 to 80 percent of um, uterine serous, and if we include amplification of HER2 by fish, that's that also includes another 20 to 40 percent, um, much less in the endometrioid type. Initial studies looked at this at drugs that targeted HER2 as a single agent. We, we saw a single arm phase two trial of trastuzumab map and HER2 positive, which was either 2 plus or 3 plus on IHC. They didn't initially look at fish positive, but they did make a subsequent amendment and then ultimately treated 34 patients based on these criteria and had a whopping response rate of 0% with a median progression-free survival of 1.8. So we lost a lot of our enthusiasm around trastuzumab and around agents that targeted HER2. However, uh, Dr. Nichol Spader at Johns Hopkins went ahead and did a randomized trial where they did better selection of these uterine serous patients based on HER2, both um, IHC and FISH, and added it to chemotherapy. So this is a randomized control trial of paclitaxel and carboplatin combined with trastuzumab, and they saw overall a benefit about a 60% reduction in the risk of progression of um, uterine serous cancers that were treated with the trastuzumab. They did do a combination therapy, chemotherapy plus trastuzumab, followed by trastuzumab maintenance. And interestingly, when they broke these data out, based on um, if they were upfront advanced disease, so stage three and four with no prior treatment, compared to those with recurrent disease, so they had some kind of treatment prior, you can see that although the, the benefit was definitely retained, that the, the biggest bang for the buck when you added trastuzumab to chemotherapy really was in those patients that had stage three, four disease that had never been previously treated. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about immunotherapy today. I've got immunotherapy in my cervical cancer talk. I've got a whole immunotherapy talk later later today, but it would be remiss if I didn't at least reference it here um, in regards to what we can do with immunotherapy in um, endometrial cancer. We know approximately 25% of endometrial type tumors do have microsatellite instability, which is obviously very important when we're considering <coughs> the use of immunotherapy. Um, when we consider uh, pembrolizumab, it has a, um, an approval in the United States for all comers, regardless of the tumor type, in microsatellite instability high, and this is the, the study that that was based on. It was predominantly a colorectal study um, where they were looking at mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer, but they also included mismatch repair deficient non-colorectal cancer, and all those little black bars there that are reducing in response to the pembrolizumab therapy are endometrial cancer, and so that yielded a lot of excitement, and this is definitely something we utilize in our endometrial cancer patients that have microsatellite instability. There have also been studies that have looked at pembrolizumab, the, the PD-1 inhibitor, in tumors that are PDL1 positive. 
you can see um, similar reductions in, um, in disease. This does not have a current indication, but certainly is very impressive that a proportion of patients that have a tumor that is positive for PD-1 may have benefit from the, um, from the pembrolizumab. And if you look at the spider plot on the right, the, once they respond, those are the yellow um, bars there, it's durable. They stay responding. So it, it's very rare to see once you have a benefit from this, this treatment to have it all of a sudden stop working. So once you get that benefit, these patients, it goes for years and years that they have a benefit, which is obviously very exciting. So we've also recently, um, the Garnet study was reported at ESMO, which was a phase one dose escalation of just Charlemab, another um, anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibody. Um, they had about 50% endometrioid tumors on this, um, this study, about 19% serous, and importantly had a 30% response rate. And what's interesting about this study is this is the first single agent uh, checkpoint inhibitor study that demonstrated at activity outside of microsatellite and stable disease. You can see almost a 50% response rate in the microsatellite instability high group, but a 20% response rate in the microsatellite stable group. So very interesting, hard to know, is this a different drug or you know, what did they do about a bad job of identifying patients? But it is very interesting. It'll be, um, we're really looking forward to the paper to see if we can tease out if this is a better drug than some of the others that are on the market or if there was something um, unique about it. Avelumab has also been explored in misrepair, deficient, and proficient endometrial cancer. Um, cohort one in this uh, slide is um, our patients with mismatch repair deficiency. Cohort two without, you can see really much less response in the microsatellite stable group. Um, overall response rate was 16%, and that was really led by the 26% response rate in the microsatellite instability high versus 6% in the microsatellite stable, so much more consistent with what we've seen with other drugs. Um, and that's led us to combinations. So for that population that doesn't have pembrolizumab or one of the other checkpoint inhibitors as an option, can we do combinations? I previously showed you anti-angiogenics. Lombatinib was on that list. It has modest activity as a single agent, but wow, when it is combined with pembrolizumab, we see activity. The majority of patients get some kind of benefit, and that is irrespective of microsatellite instability status or PD-L1 um, status. And so you can see on this waterfall plot, the majority have reduction in disease, and it really does not appear to be related to any molecular aberration in the patient. These are, um, if you look at Keynote 146, that's the waterfall slide, slide that I just showed you. The really hard thing is, I don't know if this is a drug combination that you guys have been able to um, uh, prescribe yet here in Saudi, but wow, is it toxic. 94% of patients have an adverse event. 70% have a grade three, and that's generally admission to the hospital. The, the big side effects we see are hypertension, fatigue, um, diarrhea and PPE, 74% have to be dosed at erupted, 50% dose reduced, and only through this, this treatment, but it is very, very toxic. Um, the, the positive data that have been demonstrated have yielded an FDA approval, so we are prescribing like that in pembrolizumab off protocol. But there is a confirmatory study that's ongoing called Keynote 775, which is a randomized phase two levatinib and pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy. Um, and, and, and this is just, in, again, so showing you that we did have an approval in September of 2019 in the United States. And finally, my labor of love, we've looked a lot at homologous combination deficiency in ovarian cancer, and I know Dr. Herzog gave you a wonderful talk yesterday on PARP inhibitors in ovarian cancer, but I'm here to tell you that, that endometrial cancer is gonna be where it's at. We are going to be using PARP inhibitors in endometrial cancer. These are data out of our lab that demonstrated that the classic abnormalities in homologous combination like the RCA mutation, ATM, ATR, RAD51B, RAD51C are all seen quite commonly in endometrial cancer. And we have further data that aberrations in the ERD1A that are very common are also found in endometrial cancer indicating possible activity. 
Um, we've looked and seen that P10 loss can also yield um, molecular combination deficiency and potential sensitivity to PARP inhibition. And so we did combine PARP with PI3 kinase inhibitors because we thought it was interesting and found really interesting synergy in breast cancer as well as ovarian and uterine cancer. And that led to a phase one study combining PARP with various agents that targeted the PI3 kinase pathway. And here's our beautiful waterfall plot. Not as pretty as lenvatinib and pembrolizumab, but we did have about a 30% response rate to um, for endometrial cancer to uh, a PARP um, mTOR combination. And so we're very excited about that and are exploring that further in a randomized trial that's going through uh, the gynecologic oncology group right now. So in summary, um, you know, we, we know that we've done what we can with chemotherapy. The therapeutic ceiling really has been reached. Paclitaxel and are the standard of care, and now we're looking at either drugs that we can add to paclitaxel and carboplatin, or even novel combinations that we can use in lieu of um, chemotherapy. And, and I think I've hopefully convinced you that our most promising areas are in combinations around the pediatric kinase pathway, anti-angiogenesis, as well as PARP inhibition. So with that, I thank you so much for your attention. I'm glad we didn't have as many technical difficulties, and I look forward to um, hearing your questions.